Thank you very much, Mr. Abdul, President. Um, and all members of this association present, and all visitors. This is not a very happy time for me. In fact, it's a very bad time for me. In fact, I never thought I'll be talking about government to government relations. At this time, when I started the fight for it 40, over 40 years ago, I was just approximately 36 years old. It was the first public statement I made in my life. The Lloyd Best Institute used to meet with the JCC every month, public meeting with the press present. And my good friend, Ruskin Punch, who was in charge of the architects at that time, asked me to do a presentation he didn't give me a topic, but of the obvious topic at that time will have been government to government. And I prepared two papers, one of which I tore up, because the first paper was one in which I was attacking the university for their lack of what I will call common sense. Okay? And I decided this is not a time to attack any time, anybody who's local. Then I prepare that paper for government to government. The responses to that were enormous. The room was filled with about 300 people. Like I had a standing ovation for over 15 minutes. I never spoke about government to government publicly in that format again. However, Your organization have given me a very strange task. I go this way. I must admit that when your chairman requested that I give the feature address at your annual ritual, the release of the procurement corruption index for Trinidad Tobago 2019, I was first hesitant and requested a few hours to contemplate on his request. I accepted after a few hours, and later the following day, requested a formal invitation be forwarded. The formal invitation was a second surprise. I was required to deliver the feature address on the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Act and its importance in achieving political integrity. Now for me, political integrity it's a philosophical situation. We live in a climate, both in here and internationally, whose political integrity is almost non-existent. We started off with the question of the churches and the issue how, of how they could achieve politi political integrity. So the, the, the works on that are very old. In fact, some of that go back to the Greeks. So I wasn't quite sure what he meant by that. I said to myself, what does this mean when we are now in a crisis as the present administration has delayed pro proclamation of Act Number 1 of 2015 for four years and, attempting to, and is now attempting to gut the Act of Clause 7, its most important provision. The Minister of Finance stated that the government will seek Parliament tree approval to amend the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Act to clarify the role of the Office of Procurement Regulator. Look at the terms, clarify. This has, been in, this has been in the field for over three administrations. In government to government contracts and with public-private partnership. I also wrote a, a paper on public-private public, public, partnership before it is a Canadian embassy had a presentation of that, and I spoke of that. He said discussions centered on whether Section 7 of the Act should be amended to exclude those two types of procurement from OPR. It's going to be very difficult to enter into an agreement, a contractual arrangement, with a sovereign, gov sovereign government to su supply goods and services to Trinidad and Tobago, and then subject that government 
to the public to Act Number 1 of 2015. Actually, to say that demonstrates an internal weakness and advertising to all foreign governments what you consider to be your internal weakness, what you consider your internal weakness to be. You haven't started to negotiate, but you have demonstrated what you think your internal weakness will be. Then, in fact, the debate in the Senate In the House of Representatives, the position taken by the PNM was that this is generally law in the right direction. We in the Senate were given the instructions by our political leader, Dr. Keith Rowley, to vote for this bill. Alice Hansard, May 2014. The bill was passed by a three-fifths majority. I'm not going to, um, to try to understand what that means. That's a debate for the legal people on constitutional matters. The UNC government has spent five years avoid, avoiding the implementation of a, model, a modern transparent form of equitable public procurement system. In its dying days, merely as a public relations exercise, it has partially proclaimed certain sections of the Public Procurement and Disposal Property Act, which are just symbolic in nature and of no effect. That's a statement in the PNM Manifesto. In fact, I had to go publicly and decide I will separate myself from the two organizations which I belong to, the JCC and the Private Sector Society, Civil Society Group, because I made a decision when I saw what the first draft that was going, the last draft that was going to Parliament excluded Clause 7. And I said, this is not a time for partisan politics. This is not a time for asking for partisan people to support you. That's how we operate. And I decided to go public and burn the bill. That is, the bill was never really burnt because it came out in the newspaper very early on, I think it was a Sunday, just before Easter. And the then government rushed to make the necessary amendment. Well, you, you've read all that the Minister of Finance has just said. And that is after the, the bill, the act, in terms of passing its regulations, have been delayed by four years under his purview. What does political integrity mean? We would prefer to give the simplest of explanation. It means exercising political power consistently in the public interest. That is, not to, not to sustain power holders who own wealth or position on independent private interests. Political integrity is enhanced, enhanced and protected when the recruitment of political power holders, holders, example elections, successors, delegations, is free from the undue interest, undue vested interest. Decision making by political power holders provides all concerned stakeholders with equal, open, and meaningful opportunities to influence decision making. Now, I didn't want to go too much in, the whole, in depth in the whole issue of the question of polit political integrity. However, I wish to tell you now that there is a press release out by the Private Sector Civil Society Group. I do not know if it has hit the press yet. They will be commencing the press on it by now, today. I haven't looked. But I know it is going to be out fully in its final form on Sunday. The Private Sector Civil Society Group is deeply disturbed 
with respect to the non-operationalization of, of the substantive provisions of the Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Property Act of 2015. This is part of the release. The private sector group notes, suppose national rational for lack, notes of the supposed rational for lack of progress of this implementation process in the public domain by individuals and entities. Continue to say it is unacceptable to the private sector civil society group that the act has reached current state of function, non-implementation implementation from its conception, spanning three different administrations. The level of progress achieved in implementing this act is intolerable, particularly after repeated commitments by this administration to have the act fully proclaimed prior to and since coming into office. The private sector civil society group stands firm that there should be no amendments to act number 77 in act number one, no, no, section seven of act number one, 2015, Public Procurement and Disposal of Property Act with respect to public and, and also the section with respect to public-private partnership and government-to-government -government transactions. We said in that press release that those positions are non-negotiable. This was a critical issue in the 2014-2015 Parliament that debated the bill and remains so now in the architecture of the bill. Then in that press release, we ask for an immediate proclamation at a minimum of the following sections immediately after implementation until these sections of the act do not require proclamation of the regulations. I won't read out the sections to you now, but when you see them, what they mean is that you have a regulator, you have a board of procurement regulation in place, you have that board being financed on two occasions. I know the amount of $26 million was allowed to them in the first case. I don't, I'm not quite sure what was allowed in this case. And no reporting to parliament. But there are sections of the act which can be proclaimed, which will not allow the views of the board of procurement regulation to be represented by the minister of finance. They must speak on their own behalf. And the only way to do that is to proclaim those sections that I've set here so that the board can go and give its report directly to both houses of parliament and the minister. Once that is done, so I think to some extent, when proclamation, initial proclamations were being done, it's a pity we missed that. I was in the committee that was involved in that process. Once that was done, the shenanigans that are occurring now were not likely to occur. However, we are late, and it is better to be late than never. The implementation of the Act should structure the role of Parliament as an avenue for discourse, disclosure and discourse on further implementations of the Act. This is buttressed by the role of Parliament as the body in, in the act that holds the Office of Procurement Regulation accountable, not the minister. That is the nature of the, and then we said we'd be holding a press release. But we note a press conference. That is the nature of the press release, that you should see some of it out, or commencing it out by today. I don't know if they're out yet, but I know the full press release will be there on Sunday with all signatories of all members of the private sector civil society group in attachment. Those members include the Joint Consultative Council, the two chambers of commerce, that's the American and our chamber of commerce. It includes FITON. It includes also Manufacturers Association. Uh, I don't know if I have all. But that's what I'm seeing. It is a pop complete cross-section of people. And the activity that is going to go on from here on now is to have civil society activated to understand where we are in this whole process. We cannot now be silent. 
In the opening remarks, in my statement, I said in the late 1940s and 1950s, and even up to the early 1960s, we, the people of this, con this, this country, repeatedly, routinely, and ritually exhibited quite natural capacity to maintain and progressively develop those services which were, are essential to life, love, and living in Trinidad and Tobago. Since then, we have been investing vast resources. We have virtually committed our soul to the raising the levels of our capabilities through formal education. We ins insisted on any, if we have insisted on anything at all, we have insisted on training the personnel required to give meaningful expression to the political independence, which we have just recently won. And then I went through a whole series of things that we have started in the field as architecture, engineering, construction, that, have been, that we have accomplished so far. So that was, all that was a shock to me. And to come back now and have to deal with that, after the Bala report was submitted, that was submitted under um, Prime Minister Chambers. It is a devastating report. You could not get a more devastating report. I think if I could remember rightly, there are approximately about 50 projects, of which two thirds of those projects were stopped in the Bala report. And he gave a clear understanding of things that we should not do in Trinidad and Tobago on any type of situation like that. So that is where we are at now. We had a long fight over three generations to get this act passed. We are now back taking out of it the very integrity of the act and telling us about what foreign governments will be concerned about. And that's an insult. We were in touch already with all the international lending agencies and some of the foreign governments, and they were, in fact, in favor of our approach. They, th they thought that our approach to procurement legislation was quite phenomenal. The UNDP, the UNDP was in support. The IADB was in support. In fact, all the lending agencies were in support. The Canadian government was in support. In fact, you know, the Canadian government had an issue just before that of SNV Lavendlin, right? And um, they were definitely in support. I spoke to the Canadian ambassador. The British government was in support. How could we advertise before all these governments at this stage, what is your perceived weakness in any negotiation procedure. How could you do that? So that is very damning to the psyche of anybody in Trinidad and Tobago. The Bala report, if you need a copy, I can send it to you. I don't think that is on our website. But what we did with respect to what we did with respect to the act, or my statement then, is on the website. Then we also have a situation where the premier manifesto said it quite like clearly that they intend to, many, to implement the act. Quite clearly. Four years have passed and virtually nothing has happened. We have had a procurement, Board of Procurement Regulation implemented. We have had them financed. After that, nothing. There has been a continuous debate between the regulator or the Board of, Reg of, of, of Regulation 
and the Ministry of Finance, of which we are not completely preview to. I can't say completely, can I say we are not preview to, because we know <laughs> Mr. Dalchan very well. We have been talking to him continuously. So we have some idea of what is going on as such. It is not for me here to disclose what those conversations are. The whole idea of the act, when we're talking about political integrity, is, is to enhance the issue of political integrity and protect, and this is why it becomes strains of transparency. When the recruitment of political power holders, example, elections, succession, designation, etc., is free from the undue influence of vested interest. Decision making by political power holders provides all concerned stakeholders with equal and open and meaningful opportunities to influence the decisions. Decisions by political power holders are subject to scrutiny by the public and through institutional checks. I don't know where we go from here. I don't know how rough in the field this debate is going to be. I don't know. But we'll be there. We'll be looking after the, the public interest. It is an issue that started 40 years ago when I think I was only, only 36 or 37 years old. And it has to continue. I am sad now that I'm still alive to continue that debate. <laughs> I am saddened by that very fact. So I hope you understand the necessity for continuing that debate and for all the role that all stakeholders in this country have a right and, and a duty to understand what is going on. In fact, I can tell you so far that as far as what the clause 7 says, because it refers to another clause, I think it's 24, in which, in which clause 7 refers to the fact that the regulator, when he gets these issues from the government, he doesn't get it first. It is the respective organization in Trinidad that is involved in the procurement process, does an analysis, passes it to the regulator, and the regulator passes that to parliament. So the final oversight situation is not the regulator. The final oversight situation in that act is the issue of parliament. So you're going to ask parliament to remove its responsibilities from the act and put it back in the hands, put it back in the hands of a minister. We have to be careful. The use of the word government in Trinidad and Tobago is prolific. What we mean then is a ruling party. What we mean then is a, is a minister in charge of the issue at the time. That's what it means. That is what it means. Right? So you're putting it back in the, in, the, in the hands of a minister who will be the one that will be responsible for all that is going on and all the checks and balances that we're involved in. That is crazy. That is crazy. We have an opportunity to have an act passed, proclaimed, fully proclaimed, in such a way that there is proper oversight and fully proclaimed in a manner that we are proud of as citizens of Trinidad and Tobago. Thank you very much.